we really want to welcome all of you participants that are students and educators from grades four through 12 and beyond from 32 different states. I noticed we've got folks from Colorado, Brownsville, Texas, Maine, and more, as well as eight different countries from around the world. So we are really excited to have all of you with us today, whether you're listening to our live broadcast from the NASA Johnson Space Center today, or whether you are listening to our archive. A really special welcome to a very busy individual, our featured speaker, Dr. Paul Abel. Paul is so, so very busy with different missions, but the excitement of the DART mission and his willingness to share those post-impact updates with all of you today, we're really, really uh, happy to have Paul with us so that he can share with you, again, a little bit of a what was DART all about, as well as what are some preliminary results that we have found? So with that, welcome everybody. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn things over to Paul. So Paul, if you'll introduce yourself and then get yourself started with your presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Paige. Welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to have everybody uh, with us. Um, so my name is Paul Abel. I'm uh, based here in uh, NASA Johnson Space Center, which is in Houston, Texas. I'm a planetary scientist, and uh, basically what I work on mainly are asteroids, and particularly near-Earth asteroids. So I'm what they call a planetary geologist, and um, you think of a geologist maybe on Earth who uses a rock hammer and a magnifying glass to look at uh, their rocks. Well, I'm a planetary geologist, so I have to use really big telescopes and spacecraft to look at my rocks. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the DART mission, um, which is a, a mission to an asteroid. It's all about planetary defense. I'm going to talk about that. And uh, hopefully you'll have uh, learned something and have a good time at, at the same time. So I'm going to begin. Uh, I'm going to stop my video and uh, then start sharing, sharing the screen. Good. OK, so here's the DART mission, guys. Double asteroid redirection test. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it and also tell you uh, what actually happened. So let's begin. OK, so planetary defense, this is an international enterprise, right? We need a lot of people uh, to do this. So we have many, many institutions. You'll see them scroll by there. Um, it's uh, we have over 100, 100 institutions over 200 people from 28 different countries all working on this, right? Basically, these are fireballs, these little dots here, and hopefully you can see my mouse. Every one of these little dots, you can see it hit, they're hitting all over the world. These are asteroids that are coming in and exploding in the upper atmosphere. And the size and the color represent how much, how big they are and therefore how much energy they explode with. So you notice this one right here, this is a really big one. This is the Chelyabinsk impact that happened in 2013. You can go on the internet and look up Chelyabinsk and see what happened. It was a small asteroid, about 20 meters in diameter, but it exploded with lots and lots of energy. Um, 500 kilotons, almost 30 times more explosive than some of the atomic weapons that were used in World War II. Fortunately, um, you know, while this happens, these are data from 1988 to just you know last month, September 15th of, of this year, um, these are small. They happen you know relatively frequently, but they're small in our atmosphere of Texas. But things that are bigger, like Chelyabinsk, they tend to get get through. They penetrate down further into the atmosphere, and can give us a bad day. So this particular event in Chelyabinsk, we had over 1,600 people hurt. No one died, um, but 1,600 people were hurt. So this is something that we just got to keep an eye on. Um, and if you remember what happened to the dinosaurs 65, 66 million years ago, they got wiped out by an asteroid. Um, they didn't have a planetary defense program. They didn't have space program. Um, we do. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's why we're doing the DART mission. So here's just to give you a little bit more sense about the um, the asteroids and, you know, this is what I also joke about when I say it's my job security slide. So on the top here, I have asteroid diameter, the frequency, 
what happens when they impact the number and how well we've done in terms of discovering them. So you notice the really big guys, you know, the size of the, the dinosaur killer, this is like a 10 kilometer asteroid. We know where all those are and they're safe and we're not in any danger. The ones that are one kilometer in diameter, um, we've got about 900 of those. We did really well on these guys, 95%. Um, we know where they are and everything's safe. So we still have a little bit more work to do, but um, these are big and um, easier to see. Um, the sun reflects light off the, you know, the asteroid reflected light off the, from the sun. So our telescopes can see these. So if you're big, you're bright and you're easily detectable. So we'll be able to find these with no problem and, and hopefully have lots of warning time. But when you start getting to the smaller ones, they're harder and harder to find. There's lots of them. So you know the 160 meter one, this number is important because this is the size of the asteroid that we actually hit with DART. And you know you can see there's 20,000 of these and we've only got about 42% uh, of these found. And then when you go to smaller sizes, um, you know it's even, even more of them and we have much more work to do. That's why I say, this is my job security slide. So I could work for a very long time and not be able to find or understand all the asteroids that are out there. All right, so planetary defense. So this is what it's all about, right? So we have several things we have to do. First, planetary defense, we wanna search, detect and track. So we use our ground-based telescopes. We want to characterize figure out what they're like, we want to plan, and we want to, to mitigate, we want to protect the, the planet, uh, and then assess what we've done for them, right? How well we did when we actually tried to move them out of the way. So this is all about planetary defense. So we have several things we have to do. First though, we have to find them, and that's the most important thing. You have to see what's coming at the Earth in order to protect the planet. So um, we have uh, three rules uh, when we have to find the asteroids. It's find them early, find them early, and oh, by the way, find them early. We wanna have lots of time in order to prepare. And then once you see something, you wanna be able to defend against them, right? So we wanna be able to, we see something coming, we wanna be able to deflect it and, and protect the planet. And that's why the DART mission that NASA is doing is really, really important, right? It's all about testing and being ready for planetary defense. So just like you prepare for class or a test, you practice, um, maybe you play an instrument, so you practice the instrument before a symphony. Um, you, maybe you, you're doing sports, you have practice uh, in sports as well. So just like that, we, for planetary defense, we have to practice, and that's what this DART test mission is all about. It's practicing to defend against an asteroid maybe hitting the planet. So here is the DART spacecraft. Um, I'll, on the left-hand side here, you see the DART spacecraft. That's this gold-sized, uh, almost like the size of a big refrigerator or freezer. Uh, the solar panels are folded up. It's in this big nose cone of this rocket. There's a person there for scale. This is a nose cone of a Falcon 9 rocket. There's that nose cone up here on top, and this is the Falcon 9 rocket. So we launched from uh, Vandenberg Space Force Base in California uh, in November, November 24th, and uh, DART was sent on its way. Um, so I'm gonna, the next animation is I think gonna be a little bit about the mission itself. And so I'm gonna let this play and just enjoy, watch it. It gives you a sense of what the actual DART mission is end to end, and we'll go from there.
All right. Well, that that gives you a sense of of what we what we did and, and what actually happened. And uh, so it was it was pretty exciting. It was a a very very fantastic mission. So this is um, this is what we did basically. Um, we Dart targeted a binary system, and it hit the smaller asteroid called Dimorphos, which is this this asteroid right here. This is again this is an artist's rendition. So this is just a cartoon image, and it orbits around a larger one called Didymos, right? So here's Dimorphos. It's about 160 meters across. Here's Didymos, which is about almost 800 meters, 780 meters across. And they're separated, you know, Dimorphos orbits around Didymos. They're separated by about 1,200, almost 1,200 meters, not quite. Here's the DART spacecraft. You saw that in the animation, the solar panels deployed. It was traveling at 6.1 kilometers per second when it hit Dimorphos. And it hit at 14,000 miles per hour, okay? So that's just converting from miles per hour from kilometers per second. It's It was fast. It was really, really fast. And we impacted September 26, precisely at 7.14 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You also saw on the video the Leech Cube spacecraft that got deployed. That was deployed 15 days before DART hit Dimorphos. And that little spacecraft followed behind DART and actually got to observe what happened as it flew by. And again, we were watching from Earth, which is about 7 million miles away at the time of the impact. Um, watching with our telescopes and watching what happened. So it was, it was a pretty amazing event, but this is sort of gives you the idea of, of what, what, is, uh, what happened. Okay, just to give you a sense of scale. So here we have the DART spacecraft, 19 meters across with its solar panels deployed. Remember the center part is about the size of a large freezer or fridge. You got the Statue of Liberty, if people are familiar with that, the Great Pyramids, here's Dimorphos, which is about 160 meters, the Eiffel Tower, One World Trade Center, and Didymos, which is 780 meters. So binary asteroid system, one bigger asteroid, one smaller asteroid, Dimorphos is our target. And here's, uh, here's what we, we did. So we're watching the system. Uh, we're watching the system from Earth. So we have Earth-based observations. You see Earth in the lower left-hand side there. And we're watching the orbit of Dimorphos as it goes around Didymos. And we've characterized the system before impact. DART comes in, and DART actually hits it pretty much head-on. Deploys Leech Cube, like it says. DART hits, and Leech Cube flies by and watches what we actually did to it. Now, if we were successful, we'd put Dimorphos in a new orbit. And that would change things up a little bit. And the orbit would be very different. And the time that it would take to go in that near orbit would be different too. And we can measure that again uh, by Earth-based observations. And that's what we have been doing and are continually doing uh, right now. We have telescopes around the world that are watching Didymos and Dimorphos and trying to figure out um, what has actually happened and what we did to it. So here's a question for participants. Okay, this is for you guys. How do you think the DART team, me and my team, can assess the results of the impact of the spacecraft on Dimorphos? Put your answers in the chat. Paige, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, and so you might have heard a few hints about this that Paul was previously speaking about, but we wanna sort of get a sense from you of how do you think they can assess any details that you want to share in the chat? And if you um, if you want to start your, your answer by, with your school or org name, if you're not signed in as such, please feel free to so that we can uh, highlight uh, your group. So uh, we're getting some answers like by measuring the time it takes to orbit Didymos, uh, we've got a solar system ambassador from Florida saying uh, you can look at if you change the orbit. Well, we want to know how. How can you measure the orbit? So we've got a solar system ambassador that mentions by using math and physics. Uh, so think about how might we... What, where do we get this data from? And I would agree there's likely a lot of math and physics. And this is a tough question. 
you know, how can they see what has gone on? Um, how can they look at data? What type of data might they be able to uh, get information from? So Vintage Magnet says you can measure the orbit using data from satellites. Okay, how about Creekview says planetary geologic computer programming. Excellent. Uh, uh, we've got a solar system ambassador that says satellite observations. Uh, uh, and we also have from uh, Prairie School, Earth-based telescopes and other satellites. Um, I, what's interesting is I haven't seen anything from um, related to the spacecraft itself. Oh, but we did have an input in there from a solar system ambassador about the lithium cube measurements. And another solar system ambassador from Indiana is talking about using light curves. So this is a tough, tough question. Um, and DAV Elementary or DAV School says data from instruments on the satellite and the lithium cube. St. Dominique Academy is mentioning using Earth and space-based telescopes to look at potential orbit changes and data from the lithium cube. Um, Randall Middle also highlights data from satellites. And we've got an ASU participant who's mentioning observations of the time it might take for the asteroid to pass in front of Didymos using light waves and curves. So we're, we've really warmed up here, Paul. We've got some really, actually really great input that folks have put in the chat, including Northbrook Public Library that says also about the passing of Dimorphos across the front of Didymos. So what do you say, Paul? What do you think? That's that's awesome, guys. Really, really good answers. Yeah, it's there's a lot of tools that we use, right? So we use our ground-based observations from Earth. We use some satellites that are in space in and around Earth. We use spacecraft. Obviously, the DART spacecraft helps a little bit. Um, it gets destroyed afterwards, but we get some images. But we got leech cube information. So yeah, there's lots of good stuff in there. We have many, many techniques that we use. So really, really good answers. You guys are sharp. So let's continue on here. So this is just to give an example of the number of telescopes that were involved, okay, all over the world. Every one of these is a telescope and they were uh, optical telescopes so looking like you have from through a through a real telescope and then we have radar telescopes um, with radio dishes and also radio telescopes but we also have spacecraft so we have the hubble space telescope the james webb telescope we also had the lucy spacecraft um, also look at the um, the impact event at uh, didymos and dimorphos so lots of lots of telescopes all over the world notice we have a telescope in antarctica even so it's pretty amazing the amount of international cooperation and the number of, of instruments, both spacecraft and telescopes that were used to characterize what was going on. So here's just an example of uh, the Lowell telescope. It's just a, here's a picture of the dome. This was a very large telescope that helped look. And what they were looking for is this, right? So here's just a cartoon of, uh, Didymos and Dimorphos as it orbits. And one of the things these optical telescopes do is they measure the brightness of the Didymos and Dimorphos. And you'll notice that there's a couple of dips over time as they measure. And those dips are when shadows occur on Dimorphos or when uh, Dimorphos goes into shadow, I say, um, it's eclipsed by Didymos, right? So you can see that dip matches when it's in shadow and when there's a shadow cast on uh, Didymos as well. So those dips and that timing, that's what we're looking for to see how those change, because that tells us that maybe the orbit has changed if we've done things correctly with our, our practice planetary defense test, right? So that's one way we've, we're looking at the, the results. The other way is we use um, big radio telescopes and they transmit radar. And radar is really useful because we can actually almost image, get a picture of the asteroids themselves. So this is sort of a cartoon of what happens. So we have the asteroid uh, above sort of rotating slowly. The radio dish sends a signal out and the signal reflects back 
and the uh, radio dish picks it up, collects that signal back, and then makes a picture of it. You can see down on the bottom part here. So it takes a lot of computer power and things like that, but if these radio dishes are successful, they can get an image of the asteroids. So that's also a technique that we used. But one of the other things that was really, really good to help us figure out, first of all, what the asteroids were like, both Didymos and Dimorphos, was um, our eyes on DART, which was the DRACO instrument. So that stands for the Didymos Reconnaissance and Asteroid Camera for Characterization and Optical Navigation. Right. So this is the camera. The spacecraft really only had one instrument, which was just a camera uh, on it. And it was just basically used to help guide the spacecraft towards uh, the Didymo system and then used to target into the asteroid. So the next animation I'm going to show you, this was an animation we made up just to show how um, the targeting system works. You'll see in the animation the DART spacecraft target in a red circle, the bigger asteroid first, and then it will switch over. If you look carefully, that red circle switches over and targets Dimorphos and then zooms in. So this is taken uh, roughly in the last uh, few little bits of the mission. So here we go. And you can see it. So we're maneuvering around. The red circle's on Didymos. It's the bigger one. Oh, now it just shifted. And now we're targeting on Dimorphos, and this is going to be the target. Keep in mind, this is just a simulation that we made um, before the impact event. And as you can see, we're coming in uh, pretty fast. Remember, we're traveling at six kilometers per second. Um, so that's really, really fast. That's 14,000 miles per hour. And uh, you'll see how we managed to keep, in this simulation, keep the spacecraft dead center on dimorphos and then bang we hit right so we'll get one image and then probably not much left okay so that's what the simulation was like uh, from the view of the spacecraft now here is an animation from the point of view of dimorphos so if you're dimorphos you're happily orbiting your your big uh big brother didymos there you can see you're looking around and you're looking at the night sky and things are really beautiful. It's really nice. It's nice and clear, obviously, because you're in space. You can see all the stars, some interesting constellations and all of a sudden, hey, hey, I see something. Hey, what's that? Oh, hello. And then bang, dart darts hit in, right? So again, that's just an animation from the point of view of what it would look like if you were standing on uh, Dimorphos. So here's another question. Here is a great question. How long a period of time do you think it was between DART's first view of Dimorphos until just before the impact? OK, you have some choices here. Was it months, days, hours, minutes, or seconds? Please put your answers in the chat. Paige, I'll turn it over to you. Great. And again, if you want to be able to start with your school or org name, we'll see you and give a little shout out to those of you that might be answering. And you can see reference pictures below Paul's question. So we're getting some input. Creek High, Creekview High School says minutes. One of our solar system ambassadors says seconds. We've got another, um, another group saying hours, seconds. Um, Manzano Middle School thinks it might be days. Randall Middle School says probably seconds. Uh, we've got San Benito High School that's thinking, well, maybe minutes. Uh, San Donomique uh, Academy says days or maybe two months. Um, we've got an ASU participant saying seconds. Um, Prairie, Prairie says hours. The Monsanto Middle School and Mr. Balboa's class is thinking maybe months. Uh, so, you know, it's it's mostly I, we have a diverse group of answers coming in from it's to maybe seconds to maybe months. Northbrook Public Library thinks it, it feels like it would have to be days. Um, 
Uh, so, and Dav also uh, from India says days as well. So we, we've got some diverse input there. So Paul, how long was this period of time? It was, guys, it was, it was interesting, right? Um, people who said hours and minutes were actually probably closer to the right answer. So here, here is how it actually happened, right? The, the timeline to impact. It was kind of crazy. So when we were 25,000 kilometers away, that's when we first saw uh, Dimorphos. And it was only two pixels across. You can barely see it um, in that little square there. And that's when we started tracking. So that was 68 minutes um, before the end, the end of the mission, the time of impact, right? That's crazy. So we didn't see our final target uh, until 68 minutes before. We managed to see Didymos well before but it wasn't until 68 minutes that we saw uh, Dimorphos. And it just tells you how small and how hard these asteroids are to find and target and how quickly we count upon them. So notice we are over here at 68 minutes, uh, 25,000 kilometers away. Now only two and a half minutes before impact, we're 920 kilometers away and you can start to see uh, Dimorphos there. It starts to take more of a bit of a shape. Here we are. 12 seconds before impact, we're still 70 kilometers away. Uh, and you can get a really better idea of what uh, Dimorphos is like. This is the final image that had all of Dimorphos in it. And then two seconds before impact, this is the last full image that we got. Uh, it was 12, you know, this is a 12 kilometers distance. This is about 31 meters across. So things happen really, really fast uh, on this mission, especially when you're traveling at 14,000 miles per hour. So it was pretty incredible. And we were so excited. Um, I'm just going to go through some of these images for you. So here's the, the image that was taken of the, the entire system. So both objects, uh, this is the last image of, of both Didymos and Dimorphos. Again, this was taken from 920 kilometers away. And you can start to see some really interesting things. There may be some boulders on uh, Didymos. Here's a, like a, some smooth region right in here. Um, maybe another boulder here. Uh, Dimorphos is still kind of fuzzy, but we're, we're coming in on it. And and here we are, you know, not a lot closer. Um, so we're about 70 kilometers away-ish. And you get to see this is Dimorphos now. This is our target. And you can see there's a boulder here, partly in shadow, lots of boulders and rocks, this big boulder sticking out here, a different shape. So amazing, amazing image. And this is one of the ones we had right before impact. It was just um, just incredible to see this in, in real time. And you notice the rocks are all jumbled up, um, very angular. They're not rounded, you know, like you would find in a stream. They're all jumbled up and broken. Um, lots of different sizes, some bigger ones. Again, keep in mind this distance across is about 31 meters. So about a third of a football field across, just to give you a sense of scale. And then this is the last image we got uh, right before the spacecraft crashed. All right, so the next video I'm gonna show you is an actual real video of the spacecraft uh, as it came in. So uh, I'm gonna show this video. Um, this is the final images, the last five and a half minutes, uh, sped up 10 times except for the last six images. So you're riding along with, with Dart. Uh, Draco's trying to keep um, Dimorphos in the frame. You can see it jerking around a little bit. That's because the spacecraft is maneuvering to try and keep a Dimorphos in that target so we can hit dead center. And you can see we're coming in again, 14,000 miles per hour, 6.1 kilometers per second. And just see how this looks as we get up close and personal with Dimorphos. And there it is. There's the last, the last image it was um, trans being transmitted right um, right as dart crashed into and destroyed got destroyed so we only got a partial image yeah it was it was really really awesome so again just to give you some sense of uh, a little bit another look uh put in a different orientation those are the these are the same images but just in a different orientation so again this is about two and a half minutes uh before impact uh, um, 920 kilometers away and you get to see what the the asteroids are, are like so the interesting thing is this side faces uh, Dimorphos. So you can see this, this that we think it's a boulder is facing this part of Didymos. So this is Dimorphos, this is Didymos, this big boulder here is facing this way. 
And here's uh, Dimorphos, about 11 seconds, probably taken about 68 kilometers uh, away um, as we're coming in to hit almost dead center, as you can see. So yeah, it's really awesome. And then this is the set, you know, the, the last full image that we got. It's taken two seconds before impact, 12 kilometers away. Uh, and this is 31 feet across, like I said. So just give you another sense, another look at some of these boulders and, and what the surface of Dimorphos uh, looked like. All right, so here's another image. This is, remember I mentioned Leachy Cube? So Leachy Cube, uh, these are two images that are taken about six seconds apart. This is before and after the impact. So you can see it before, it just sort of, you know, Dimorphos is there. Um, and then all of a sudden, six seconds later, we impact and you see the big flash, right? So this was taken from over a thousand kilometers away as Leachy Cube is flying by the uh, by the asteroids, and you can see it. Here's another image. So this is taken a little bit closer. So here's uh, Didymos, right? And here is uh, Dimorphos. And one of the neat things you can see is all this ejecta, all this material that's being thrown off. See how crazy this looks? Just really, really interesting. This is all material that's been thrown off the asteroid after DART's impact. This is only three minutes after, and we have all this material uh, coming off. So pretty, pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing stuff. Here's another image. Uh, this was taken a, a 76 kilometers, so it's a slightly uh, different orientation, different vantage point. So Leachy Cube is flying through along this side. So this material, all this ejecta, is in front of uh, Dimorphos. Dimorphos is underneath this. Here's Didymos. But again, you can see all this wispy, clumpy ejecta um, that was captured at this at this distance from Leachy Cube. So we were really lucky to have uh, cooperation from the Italian Space Agency that helped us um, get these amazing images. Because without Leachy Cube, we wouldn't have known, uh, we wouldn't have had these great images and known exactly what it was like with the ejecta in or around Dimorphos and Didymos. And then here's another view of it, 75 kilometers, but taken uh, looking back. So now Leachy Cube has flown by, but remember, as Leachy Cube flows by, it it tracks the asteroid, so it moves its camera, so it keeps the camera always focused on Dimorphos. And you can see the ejecta is, looks different from this vantage point, right? Before we were looking from over here and looking down, here's Dimorphos, here's the ejecta, and you can see how it looks almost like here's one edge of the ejecta cone, here's another edge of the ejecta cone. There's no, doesn't look like there's any ejecta out this way. Um, but again, it, it's really clumpy. Um, there's a lot of it. So it's very, very interesting. Very, very interesting stuff. Here's a movie. Um, this is from Leachy Cube. As it's going by, you'll see the distance as it counts down. So it gets through to close approach here in a bit and then switches over as it flies by. And now we're looking at the same asteroid, but now looking away. And you can see how the ejecta is just just all over the place. It's crazy. It's it's amazing. So a lot of this we have to figure out what this means, and you know that's why we do the test, right? So we know we've we've done uh, some some stuff to the asteroid, right? There's lots of ejecta being thrown around. So that's what it looked like from space, uh, up close and personal, uh, via Leachy Cube, and Here's another image. So this is the same, uh, one of the same images, but what we've done here, the team has done, see these squares here? Well, these squares are different contrast levels. And basically this just helps us bring out the detail of all the ejecta. And it, it's this sort of crazy, so almost like a, a starburst type pattern with lots of wispy trains, uh, clumpiness. It's not uniform. It's not all what we call symmetrical. So really, 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 um, really amazing, amazing stuff. And see how far it goes out, you know, well past. There's a big clump here. Lots of interesting things that we have to figure out what this all means. So this is what it looked like from the ground. 
So this is one of the uh, telescopes we had at the ground. This is the Las Cumbres Observatory Telescope. This is just one example. There, there are many, um, but I chose this one just because it's dramatic. These were taken 12 and 15 minutes after the impact, and you can see all this material. You can see it here blowing off in this movie. See how the asteroid gets really, really bright, been hit. This is light that's reflected both from Didymos and Dimorphos, but that ejecta, that material that's flying off at high speed, that's all coming from Dimorphos. So that's something um, that is a different vantage point that we get from the ground. So it gives us extra information that we can use to try and figure out what happened. So that's why the ground-based observations are so important. And this is what it looked like September 28th. So remember, we hit September 26th. This is only a couple of days later. This is a ground-based telescope in Chile. And here is uh, Didymos and Dimorphos. Here's the ejecta um, as it's spread out a little bit more. Here's the ejecta and this really nice long tail, almost like a comet, right? But it's not a comet. This is material that's been uh, liberated, lifted off the surface of Dimorphos. So this this is this tail is like now tens of uh, thousands of kilometers long. It's really, really long. It's a long tail. So very, very dramatic and very interesting image. So that's what we got from the ground. We had other space-based assets though. We had the Hubble, uh, which is orbiting Earth and James Webb, which is out in deep space. They all looked at uh, Dimorphos and Abinus and this is what they saw. There's lots of ejecta here as well. So here's the direction of impact. The sun is over on this side. So you can see uh, just how dramatic the impact was. Here's a movie um, pre-impact for five hours on, on James Webb. And you can see how bright and all this material that's being thrown off of uh, uh, Dimorphos. So this is a very, very interesting image as you can start to see clumps of material all throughout here flying away. And it's it's very dramatic. So we were pretty excited to get this this image. This was really hard for the James Webb Telescope to do, by the way, because the asteroid is moving so fast. Um, so it had to track really, really high at high speed, and that was difficult for this big telescope to do. So we were really thankful that the James Webb team could help us with this. So this is tremendous data. Um, this is what it looked like from Hubble. So 22 minutes after impact, you can start to see things here. Five hours. 8.2 hours. Don't worry about these spikes here. This is what you get from what we call diffraction spikes, but it's all this stuff. See the ejecta cone and all the streamers, all, all that is what we're really interested in. And then here's a movie of those images just put together. You can see as it, as the ejecta moves out from the asteroid over time, again, 22 minutes to eight, eight about a little over eight hours after impact. So really, really fantastic. Uh, fantastic data. And then here's another image that the Hubble took. Uh, this is from October 8th. So, uh, you know, just not quite two weeks after impact. Here's the uh, Dimorphos and Didymos. Notice this, this ejecta, you know, sweeping out. It looks like the sun's solar radiation pressure is pushing material back. And then you've got this, this long tail, almost like a double tail. It looks like a comet, but again, it's not. So all this material is streaming out as uh, the asteroids fly through space and all this material is being left behind as it moves through. So it was a tremendous, tremendous hit. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the slide again because this is sort of to help you orient you for the next slides that I'm gonna show you that explains what we measured. So keep in mind that we have ground-based telescopes that are looking for the change of brightness versus time and the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos has those dips that are very precise. They repeat all, all the time, right? So these dips meant that the period of, of uh, Dimorphos around Didymos was about 11 hours and 55 minutes. So remember that number, 11 hours, 55 minutes. Okay, so we measure the brightness and the dips and the time. Okay, so here's observations of the DARP impact and each one of these little dots is a measurement of the brightness right over time so this data is taken from September 29th this these data are taken from October 4th each one of these little dots is an observations from the telescopes 
previously we knew that the orbit was 11 hours 55 minutes right but if that was where the dip was there's no dip here look there's no dip here right but we have a dip here from the new orbit that matches up to a period of 11 hours 23 minutes again over here from october 4th 11 hours 23 minutes so that means we changed the orbit of Dimorphos by 32 minutes. Holy cow. OMG. That's my friend there, Harry. He is absolutely like, what? That is amazing. That is a lot. We were expecting or hoping for about 73 seconds a period change, but we got 32 minutes. That's amazing. So that's awesome. Okay, that's from Light Curve. But we also have radar, remember? We have the radar uh, from the radio telescopes, the radar, planetary radar. So this is data from October 9th. This is a little hard to see. So these are all different times on the same day. The green circle there shows where Dimorphos is. This is Didymos in these images, okay? So we can, the radar can track where Dimorphos is relative to Didymos. The radar beam is coming down from the top in this image. And so you get to see this part of the asteroid of Didymos and then this part of Dimorphos. But we get a very, very accurate position of where Dimorphos is with respect to Didymos. Okay, so good news is, first off, we know that Dimorphos is still there. So there's Didymos, right? You can see the, the shape of the asteroid here by the radar in here. And here's Dimorphos. So we know Dimorphos is still there. We didn't blow it up or anything. It's still there. So that's great. But it's moved. So here's the orbit that it would have been in originally before. We know this because we measured this before. Here's the expected position if it was on 11 hour, 55 minute. But it's not. It's down over here now. Here's data from October 4th. Here's data from October 9th. So what does that mean? This is a, a different technique. Remember the light curve came up with 32 minute change? Well, so did the radar. 32 minutes. What? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Again, remember 73 seconds, but we moved it by 32 minutes. That's just tremendous. It's just tremendous, right? So we're super, super pumped. We're very happy and very excited. All right, here's a question. So we, we've, we've moved the asteroid, it's amazing, but why do we do this mission, okay? So Earth is not currently at risk of being impacted by a large asteroid. So I wanna make sure that everybody understands that, you know, we, we are working very hard at NASA and our international uh, colleagues on planetary defense. We don't see anything dangerous happening right now, but we have to be ready just in case. So why is this DART mission so important? So I want to make sure you put the answer in the chat. Why is the DART mission important for uh, not only you, but everybody? So please put your answers in the chat. Paige, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Paul. And so as we look to see some answers, Creekview is saying, so we don't end up like the dinosaurs. Um, we have another individual saying to divert a possible future asteroid from hitting us. One of our solar system ambassadors from Indiana says it's like a proof of concept and the checking our ability to change in orbit. Um, Mr. Balboa's class from Monsanto Middle School there in Brownsville says as a practice in case we ever actually need to use this to protect us. And I'm glad, Paul, that you have mentioned that again, to reinforce the fact that Earth is not currently at risk of being impacted by a large asteroid. Uh, and so this input that folks are sharing with us is still giving us some great information about why is it that we're prepared. And so uh, Prairie says exactly what I just started to say, to be prepared before it's too late. Technology used in other aspects. We've got an ASU individual saying a slight redirect of an asteroid headed our way could make a world of difference. Randall Middle says if we need to deflect an asteroid, then we can use the DART mission technology to protect Earth. 
Another solar system ambassador says, we know the speed of impact, the size, the weight of the asteroid impacted, and we can scale up in case a larger asteroid is heading toward the Earth. And so all of these answers that I'm seeing come in, including St. Dominique Academy, which is saying to protect ourselves if a large asteroid does come towards Earth, you know, they've got their thinking caps on, Paul, and I'm sure a lot of the information you have shared um, really helps them get a, get a fuller understanding of this. So while some input may still come in, uh, Paul, I'll turn things back to you. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome, everyone. Those, those are really great answers, and, it, and it's exactly right. We want to be prepared. Um, we want to be able to make sure that we can um, be ready uh, if we see an asteroid that's headed our way, we want to be able to do something about it, right? So this was just the first test. Um, and, you know, if we see something, maybe a bit bigger asteroid um, or different type of asteroid, you know, we can use this information uh, to help us uh, deflect one in case we have to do it for real. So uh, excellent, excellent point. So again, right, remember what I said, this is just the first, the first test. Um, we're planning to do some more things. I just wanted to show you this image, and this is the, the image, the, the last full image we got right before impact. And then on the lower uh, left-hand side of the screen there, you can see uh, our DART operations team. Everybody's clapping, everybody's cheering. Uh, I know on the science team, when I was there with the science team, we were all super excited and super happy because at this moment, we knew we were gonna hit. We were gonna hit, we were gonna have a successful impact. And this was just the first step in in protecting, helping protect the planet from, from dangerous asteroids. So now, of course, we got to understand what we actually did, and that's what we're doing right now. I've shared with you some of the results um, that are truly amazing, and so we're trying to figure this all out, uh, and then we can apply this uh, later on. But we're going to do some more uh, practice. Um, we have some other missions planned. Um, we're talking about maybe uh, sending, launching a uh, spacecraft to help find um, the asteroids. Um, remember I said, find them early, find them early, find them early. That's the first part of planetary defense. Well, we're going to have an early warning system. So we're going to have a spacecraft that is going to be positioned between uh, the Earth and the sun that is going to look for these uh, more dangerous asteroids that will help us find them. And then we're working on other things that uh, we can have follow on to DART mission where we, we actually send spacecraft to asteroids and help uh, test more planetary defense techniques. So I wanted to end with this slide so this is um, some good information for you so there's some websites there um, please feel free to go to the dart website uh, it's the double asteroid redirection test uh, website lots of good information there a lot of the images that i shared with you are, are there as well um, you can follow us along on social media there's lots of, of interesting social media and and things that are happening so please follow us along there but also please join me and my team and the rest of us to help defend the planet. You can become a planetary defender. So please go to the website um, down at the bottom there, uh, dart.jhuapl.edu, planetary defender, and you can get a planetary defender certificate. And uh, you have to answer some questions, but I think given all the answers that you guys have, have given me, I, I think this would be not a problem for you. So I, I will leave it there. And Paige, I'm happy to take questions. And uh, just thanks everybody for attending and please um, help us defend the planet and join our Planetary Defender program. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for this amazing information. I mean, hearing it and seeing it and hearing your explanations of everything um, is really so fabulous for our folks on the line, including us that work right alongside of you. It's amazing to, to, to hear directly from you about all this amazing information. So thank you so much for, for giving us that preview about what is DART to make sure we have that context, and then for giving us all that, again, amazing uh, post-impact updates. Perfect. So I want to start off with a question that came in um, before the webinar actually occurred from Creekview High School in Georgia. And they wanted to know, they had heard that uh, the amateur, the community of amateur astronomers had contributed data for the DART mission. So can you talk a little bit to the 
amateur astronomers and have they contributed and how and that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a great question. And, and we actually got a, a lot of help from the amateur astronomy community. Um, you know, not everybody who was looking at the DART mission were what we call professional astronomers with really large telescopes. Um, some of the telescopes that we got information from were smaller telescopes that were um, operated by people who were amateurs, right? And they really helped us uh, get an idea of the brightness. Uh, if you remember that one ground-based video I showed you where it got really bright, um, they were able to help characterize that and help monitor that change in brightness when that happened, how long it lasted. So yeah, the input from the amateur community has been really, really helpful. And so we value that and, and welcome that. Excellent. Well, here's another question that came in from one of our solar system ambassadors in Indiana, and they were wondering um, what surprised you most about the mission results, if you can sort of quantify that or yeah. pick something. Yeah, I, I mean, there were so many things that were um, surprising and, and exciting. Um, I think for me, um, one of the, uh, the bit surprising things were the actual, when we got to see the the asteroids up close and personal. Um, keep in mind, this is the first time that we've actually been to a binary asteroid system. Um, and uh, seeing those shapes, um, they were a little different than what we expected. So that was that was a surprise. Um, the other big uh, surprise for me personally was just the amount of ejecta and the form it took. If you saw those images from Leachy Cube, you know, when we did computer modeling and simulations of what we thought might happen, you know, most people are like, okay, we have a very simple, straightforward, very uniform, symmetrical uh, ejecta cone, ejecta, amount of ejecta that would come out. And of course, that's not what happened at all. Um, lots of ejecta. Um, we've got these thin streamers, we've got this clumpiness, all those type of things, and it was not uniform at, at all. So that was a real surprise. And also, we got that really fast ejecta. If you saw that in the ground base that I showed you, that that plume of material that went away at, at very high speed, um, that was also a, a bit of a surprise. So um, there's some interesting things in there. Um, I, one of my mentors has, has told me, uh, especially with spacecraft missions, when you go to anywhere, but especially asteroids, be prepared to be surprised because that's part of the fun is you think you know what you're doing, you get up there and then things are completely different. So um, anyway, there are lots of surprises and it's very exciting. And we have obviously a lot of work to do to try and understand what we did uh, at the system. The one thing I will mention though, that I forgot to mention during the talk is um, we do have another spacecraft called HERA that we're working with the European Space Agency that will go and investigate um, the Didymos and Dimorphos uh, system, right? And that spacecraft is going to launch in about two years' time. It will get there probably in 2026, 2027, and it will figure out what we actually did to it. So we'll have a before and after look uh, once Hera once Hera gets there. Before with with Dart, we had some images, and then we'll have Hera go in and see what we can what we actually did to Dimorphos. Great answer, and thanks for that input additionally, Paul, because it actually uh, answered one of the additional questions that came in from a participant about, you know, what's next and future missions. Um, and so I, oh, here's a question from one of our participants in Arizona who, you know, when you were talking about, you know, looking at, you know, targeting um, the asteroid, they wanted to know how did the spacecraft target the asteroid? Was it programmed ahead of time? Was that being done in real time? Can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, remember that we're coming in really fast, right? We're traveling at 14,000 miles per hour, 6.1 kilometers per second. So the light delay time, the one-way light delay time, because um, uh, Dimorphos was still about you know 7 million miles away from Earth, so it was about 38 seconds one way. So you can't really joystick, you can't command the spacecraft and target and pinpoint the location. So a lot of that is pre-programmed in and the actual targeting uh, where DART was gonna go was all done uh, by computer autonomously, right? So the spacecraft basically was targeting. So when it was in that video, if you, sh if you saw it was moving around, that's the spacecraft using the imagery from Draco camera 
to target. Um, it's a system that they called smart nav, which is all autonomously controlled. And that's how they targeted in and, and achieved a, a brilliant, almost dead center impact from the looks of things. So it worked really, really well. Excellent. And, you know, I, I can't remember if I said this before, but in the whole expect the unexpected and, you know, try to be able to plan, plan, plan as much as you can. And then in this case, um, everything really worked out such uh, so fabulously. So uh, thank you for that uh, answer to the question. And we have another question from uh, let's see, from the Monsanto Middle School in Mr. Balboa's class, and they're in Brownsville, Texas. And they're wondering, why do the images from Webb and Hubble telescope have different colors? Uh, so at different wavelengths um, that we're looking at, the slightly different wavelengths, and then just the, the nature of the, the telescopes themselves. So um, those colors are, are a little bit false color. But those are the that's sort of why it happens. So you've got two different instruments, uh, two different uh, wavelengths uh, areas that it, they're looking at, two different types of sensors on those telescopes. So they'll the colors will look a little bit different. It's not um, anything to do with the ejecta. It's just how the data are transferred back from the telescopes down to Earth. So hopefully that answers it for you. And that was a great observation by that group to notice, you know, observational skills is such an important aspect in the science world. So great observations. And we're so glad you asked that question. Now, here's another question from Prairie School, and they're in Colorado. They're wondering about, you know, when and how did the whole idea of DART and this whole mission begin? That's a great question. So this mission was a relatively short mission in terms of when it was launched and uh, when it actually ended, you know, when the spacecraft hit Dimorphos. So we keep in mind, we launched in November uh, of last year and we hit September 26. So relative, not even a year long mission. Uh, most of the spacecraft missions I work on are seven years or, or, or sometimes even longer, right? Um, but they're multiple year missions. This one didn't even last a year. But the planning for it uh, was over 10 years. We'd been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, so almost 11 years in terms of thinking about the concept, why it would be a good idea, uh, sort of writing it all up, doing some of the analysis, and then presenting it to NASA and saying, hey, here's our idea. We think this is something we should do for planetary defense to test. And then NASA having to go and say, yes, this is great, get the money, and then uh, we're allowed to build the spacecraft, put it on a rocket and launch it, and then try and figure out, you know, the mission is still ongoing, even though the DART technically is no longer with us, the mission is still going on because we have to figure out all the analysis, all this stuff, this mission will go on for another year uh, until we figure out what, we've, what we actually did. Um, so it's a very good question. So the mission itself, very, very short operationally, but the planning and some of the results, um, that takes a long, long time. Excellent question, and thank you for your input on that, Paul. Now, related to, you mentioned, you know, of course, the DART spacecraft is no longer with us, but in terms of the Lichia Cube, we have an American school of Abu Dhabi that is wondering, will the Lichia Cube still collect data? Can you speak to that a little bit? So the Lichia Cube is finished collecting data from uh, the Didymos Dimorphos system. Um, there's still a few uh, bits of data that it has to relay back. Remember, it's a small little CubeSat, so um, the data rate is is a little bit smaller, uh, so it takes a bit longer to get all the data down that it recorded from its its two cameras. Um, but once it's done that, it, it still is going to fly on. I think the Italians, uh, Italian Space Agency is looking to see where Leachy Cube may end up, may go. Um, but the chances of it doing anything else are small. Space is really big, so it has to fly by something in a, in a relatively short period of time before it um, it is no longer operational. But they're looking into it. Um, you know, Leachy Cube is still alive. They still have contact with the spacecraft. Um, so we'll see. So stay tuned. You never know. It might actually encounter another asteroid or maybe a comet. We'll see. But it's it's chances are pretty low. But we'll see. 
Well, you know, you, you just made me look at another one of our questions to ask uh, something related um, uh, to, and there's two of them. So I'm going to get to one question first and then the other one, which your commentary particle or comment tail made me think about. But here's one of our uh, questions from um, Arizona. And they're thinking about when the ejecta was sent out in all directions, kind of like a starburst, starburst. What would cause it to form a tail-like path backward uh, behind the asteroid without air to push it backwards, like here on Earth? What would cause this pattern? So there's a there's that's a good question. So there's a couple of things. So if you think about it, the asteroid is still moving through space, but all that material was ejected from it at a single point in time, right? When that moment of impact happened, right? But all that material is flowing away so you have a couple of things going on one you have the asteroid moving away from the moment of impact so all the debris is thrown away and then trailing behind it but you also have the solar radiation pressure with some of the smaller particles that is pushing it back too and so that's what makes that we think that's what makes that long those really long tails um, that we see again we have to do more analysis on all the imagery both from the ground based and the you know from the hubble uh, data that we have um but that's what we think is going on and so stay tuned we'll have probably have a better answer we're probably going to write this up in in papers and and things like that and results um but that's almost certainly what's happening right now so it's a little different from a comet um this is all due to you know what a comet you have um sublimation so the the ice in the comet changes right to a gas and it it starts throwing particles off here this is all from a single impact that happened and then uh, bits are thrown off and then the sun uh, takes it takes it back a little bit more too. That what helps forms the tail. Well, great. Well, thank you for that uh, answer, Paul. Very uh, thorough. And you know, I, 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 one of the fun parts I think of uh, even the work that we all here get to do is you learn something new every day. And you know, the the observations that that the folks on the line are making and the questions that they ask, it just sort of sparks so much additional sort of thought process and, and a learning that goes on. So um, we absolutely love your questions and love the answers coming in by Paul as well. Um, Paul, I want to ask this one question before some of our uh, high school groups especially leave. Someone had asked early on, um, one of our solar system ambassadors, what might a, you know, um, uh, someone study uh, if they were like looking to pursue a career in planetary defense? Wow, that's a good, that's a good question. So, um, well, on our DART team, we have lots of different scientists, right? Um, and lots of different engineers. Um, so I'm a scientist, I'm a planetary uh, geologist. So I study asteroids, I study rocks. Um, but you, we have people who are, were instrumental as engineers um, building the spacecraft, right? Um, also, uh, very important people who are designing the computer program uh, to help with the targeting. Remember, I said all that was done autonomously, right? So um, DART had to target um, the asteroid in a very short order, and it had to work perfectly. So we have computer programmers. Um, we have aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. We have scientists who work on um, modeling of impact, uh, understanding how um, large uh, bodies collide together at high speed and what happens. Um, you have people like me who, who study uh, bits of everything. Um, we have people who uh, study the, the ejecta. Um, basically looking at small particles and how they are released and how they interact uh, after they're liberated from the surface of the asteroid and, and go out into space. So there's lots of areas uh, they can do. We have astronomers, um, we have physicists, um, we have geologists, um, we have engineers. So there's lots of different career paths uh, that you can take um, that can go into planetary defense. And that's that's just from the standpoint of DART. There's other aspects of planetary defense that um, you may want to consider. Um, we have lawyers who are doing planetary defense work. Um, we have emergency management uh, people who are getting ready just in case we can't protect the planet and we have an asteroid come in. What do you do? What do you do if you have to evacuate a, a city or uh, you have to all of a sudden uh, care for some people who are 
who are displaced, you know, those type of things, those emergency management um, careers as well. So there's lots of different aspects uh, of planetary defense um, that you can you can go into. So it's it's a wide field and we need lots and lots of people. Remember, I said it's it's not just, you know, one or two people, one or two space agencies, one or two countries. It's everyone. It's international collaboration. And it takes a lot of different skills and a lot of different expertise. Yeah. And, you know, the idea, too, to add on that wide array of possibilities, even artists and computer animators. I think exactly. that video that showed that you showed, Paul, um, and in the beginning of the session. And every time I watch that video, I get chills just due to the whole aspect of everything that gets put into communicating information in such a way that um, can really um, hit home for people and help them understand a, a perspective of a mission. Uh, so yeah, it, the, the possibilities are endless. So thank you for that question and for your answers there, Paul. Um, now, actually, related to the mission, one of our groups, one of our solar system ambassadors in Louisiana was wondering, you mentioned about a 73-second um, hope for um, a, a result in changing the orbit of the asteroid, and yet you mentioned 32-minute change. What was the nature of the, the, the actual, the difference? Was it the consolidation of the asteroid material or, or can, do, can, do you have any ideas of why it was in a sense so um, impactful? So I, I think, you know, we were hoping for a minimum of a 73 second. That was, that was what we were looking at. It was one of our requirements to make at least 73 seconds or, or more uh, in change of the period. And, um, again, we've never been to a binary asteroid before. We some have some ideas of how they form and what they may be like. Um, but of course we got 32 minutes, right? Um, and so I think, you know, if you look at the images, um, there was a tremendous amount of ejecta uh, put forth. So if we, for example, if we hit the asteroid and Leech Cube went by and didn't see much ejecta or hardly anything at all, then potentially the period change wouldn't have been as dramatic. We might have been closer to that 73 seconds. But if you looked at the images from Leech Cube and of course all the, the ground space telescopes afterwards, we produced a tremendous amount of ejecta. And so not only do we have the momentum of the spacecraft coming in and hitting uh, Dimorphos to make a, a slight nudge, but we have all that material that's being blown off, right, in that ejecta. And that adds an extra thrust, that adds a, what we call a momentum enhancement um, to the object. So that undoubtedly played a major role in the difference between 73 seconds and 32 minutes. So that's probably, um, you know, again, we still have to look at everything. We have to do some analysis of the data, but that's what we're, we're going at as of right now. That's our assumption that the ejecta played a big role in that 32 minute orbital period change. Excellent. And, so stay tuned. Go ahead, Paul. And I was I was just going to add, I mean, I can't stress enough how big a deal is this is. This is the first time we've actually moved a celestial object. <laughs> you know, it, it it sort of blows your mind and it it's 32 minutes. It, it's a it's a really really big deal. And and so very exciting for the whole Dart team and uh, obviously if you can't see it on Paul's face, um, you know, the the excitement and, you know, just the continued learning and looking at the data. Um, I'm sure, it, you know, even though Paul mentioned like, you know, in the next year or so, we'll continue to look at data. And I'm sure there'll be folks that will be continuing to even look at that data uh, even beyond that time period. Um, so it's just it is so very exciting. Uh, now, one of our groups from Monsanto Middle School and Mrs. De Leon's class you know, you mentioned about this material coming off of Dimorphos, and they're wondering what will happen to all of that sort of dust and debris um, that, that was ejected. So it's a good question. So it will probably, um, so some of it um, that doesn't have a lot of energy, in other words, doesn't have a lot of velocity. Um, some of it may fall back to uh, Dimorphos. Some of it may end up on Didymos because it's nearby, um, but most of it will probably get pushed out 
um, by solar radiation pressure and and just the motion, the the uh, speed at which it was released from the surface of Dimorphos, right? It it reached what we call escape velocity. Keep in mind these asteroids are are relatively small compared to Earth, so there's not a lot of gravity, so it doesn't take a lot of energy to to make you leave the system. So a lot of those pieces will be um, liberated and uh, just float around uh, the solar system. They will leave the the vicinity of Didymos and Dimorphos and uh, just flow into a, a trail. They'll follow the orbit, um, but basically that's that's what's going to happen to them. They'll just they won't come back, obviously, to Didymus or Dimorphos, but they'll be in this trail in this uh, along their orbit. Great question from Monsanto Middle School there. Um, and here's another question from Prairie School. I believe they're in Colorado. How much time would would Earth need to know to deflect an asteroid if they did detect something was out there that was um, of any danger? It's a great question. So again, right now we don't have anything bad coming at us. Just want to make sure everybody's okay with that. I sleep pretty well at night. You guys should sleep well. Um, but just in case we do, we'd like a lot of warning time, right? Um, me personally, I would like a minimum of 10 years or more. Um, that's why the whole thing about find them early, find them early, find them early. And, and the reason being you want such a large amount of time is uh, you want to know, first of all, you got something coming at you. You want to know how big it is and where it's likely to hit. And then you need to figure out what it's made of, right? Asteroids come in all sorts of different sizes, colors, compositions, uh, different types of densities and how they're put together. So one of the things we'd like to do is we see something coming. We don't just want to, you know, um, act, you know, quickly and not do the right thing. So we want to take our time and study the, the asteroid. So we want to have time to launch a spacecraft, uh, what we call a reconnaissance mission, and either fly by it or rendezvous with it to study it and figure out, okay, is this really going to be um, something we have to worry about? But that takes time to do that. And then if it is something we need to worry about, we need a little bit more time to do the mission like DART, but maybe scaled up, maybe you know, much bigger spacecraft, maybe traveling at much higher speed. Um, but that all takes time. So that's why we need, we would like, I would like um, 10 years or more. Right. We have other other techniques that we could use, possibly uh, for shorter warning time. But the idea is that we want to find these asteroids very early. That's why we have we're launching the the NEO Surveyor spacecraft, which is this early warning system I mentioned in the talk, um, to help us find those asteroids, figure out where everything is, what's coming at us, and give us the time in which to develop all the spacecraft and all the the tools and get it or all the information that we need to successfully deflect an asteroid, just in case we have to. Well, that was uh, an excellent, again, question and a great answer. And, you know, looking at the time, we are about 20 minutes past the top of the hour. And I don't think that I've missed any questions that I saw in the Q&A. And the questions were absolutely fabulous. And, the you know, the whole idea of, 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 of thinking and, you know, thinking about whether it's future missions, you know, some of the students we likely have that have been on the line here, those could be individuals, and Paul, you can correct me if I'm wrong, who in the future may propose to NASA for some other mission, because um, is that how it works? Somebody comes up with an yep. idea and they propose it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of you guys out there online, um, you know, you could end up working for NASA, you could work up for ESA, space agency, commercial company, uh, and maybe propose planetary defense style missions, right? And so, like I said, literally, that's why I mentioned the the planetary defender program. Um, we need everybody. So, yeah, if if you're really interested and and want to do it, it would be a, a great thing to do. And and uh, everybody's welcome, and anybody can can do it. So, uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. And looking forward to seeing some of you. Uh, who knows? Maybe uh, I'll be working for you one day if I live long enough. We'll see. Awesome. Well, we want to thank all of our participants from whether they're students in classrooms from all around the United States, educators in the United States, or even around the world, including I know we've got a group uh, from Columbia and an aerospace uh, academy program and some teachers in the room. 
teachers, you know, can share with their students the possibilities which are endless and the students that are out there, you know, this is a time where you can think about what kind of career path you perhaps want to take in your future and perhaps you too can be a planetary defender. Uh, so with that, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, uh, Rosina, Suzanne, and Kim for helping to monitor the chat. Uh, and most of all, thank you, Paul, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to share your excitement, the, the preliminary results, and all that you have shared with us today. We very, very much appreciate you and value all of, of what you have shared with our, um, with our groups on the line today. So thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, you're most welcome. It was my pleasure. Excellent. So thanks everyone. 